Okay, so I'm Kev, um, and I'm an embedded penetration tester. So I work for a large company. I can't name them because I'm not here officially in, in the capacity of speaking on their behalf or anything. Um, but they, amongst a number of other things they do, they make uh, embedded devices that they sell. And I kind of work for the team that tests the security of those devices before they're sent out to market. The idea being that we get about a month to have a look at these devices and see if there's holes in them, Find out, try and work out what attackers who buy these products might do to them before we sell them and try and fix those holes so that they have less opportunity. We are very much hunting for the low-hanging fruit uh, because we don't have time to do a complete job of finding every bug. I mean, you know, it's a bit of a guess as to whether or not it's ever possible to find every bug, but it's certainly in the timescales we have, it's impossible. So... We look for the things that we think people will find, and we get them fixed. Um, now, whether your, interest, whether your interest is similar and you're looking to find bugs, or whether you just want to take one of your own devices and be able to run your own code on it, make it do something it wasn't supposed to do, um, I'm hoping there's going to be something in this talk for you, and I'm going to go for it quite quickly. If you don't understand some of the terms, then I'm sorry. Just come and find me in the portcullis tent later, and I'll explain I don't work for them, by the way, um, but, <laughs> but find me in the portcullis tent who are hosting me later if you want to talk and ask some questions. Uh, so embedded devices, here's, here's some examples. You've got an internet router, uh, there's an IP camera, there's a mobile phone, and there is a child tracker. Um, they're all embedded devices. Uh, three of those things run variations on Unix. Obviously, the phone is BSD, but the other two things are probably on Linux. The child tracker itself is an embedded device that probably doesn't run Linux. It runs off a microprocessor with its own stack, uh, which is incredibly difficult to uh, get to change because a lot of the, there's a lot, a lot less structure to them. We're going to focus on the ones that uh, deal with Linux because that is 99% of the embedded devices that I see. And yeah, so they kind of run Linux. The trouble with embedded devices is they lack processing power. And because they lack processing power, they can't have all of the modern protections that you find on modern Linux servers or desktops. Um, at the same time, though, because they're an embedded device, they don't have a keyboard or screen. Um, they have minimal interfaces, uh, minimal services running on the network um, for you to interact with. So there's less to look for, or, or there's less places to look, I should say. Um, but when you go looking, there's less protections in place to stop you. So they are an interesting set of things to hack. And uh, you can do quite a good job with these things. So as I say, there is lots of low-hanging fruit. That's what we're going to look for. The main thing that you find is there's no user or process separation on these devices. Um, out of all of the embedded devices I've looked at, one had a user that wasn't root um, and ran processes that weren't running as root. But everything else, they all run as root. Um, sometimes they rename the root account, but as long as it's UID0, who cares? It's, it's still root. So if you can get one bug, you are root. You can do everything. Um, now, when people talk about uh, embedded testing, they often think about the hardware because, you know, isn't that the cool bit? Or maybe it is. I mean, this, this is my toolkit. There's only one specialist tool in that slide, and that's the Lego brick separator tool. They're £1.99 from the Lego shop, either online or in person. And they're brilliant. And the reason they're brilliant is because they don't damage things as much. If you, want to, if you want to get a case apart, straight in with the screwdriver, make a gap in with the Lego tool, and then just get rid of the screwdriver. If you try and take a case apart with the screwdriver, you'll be knocking components off boards, you'll be scratching things, you'll be smashing clips. With the Lego tool, and it's open. So I do recommend them. If you're an embedded tester, you definitely need one. Uh, in reality, of course, embedded testing is 99% Linux hosting, host auditing and 1% hardware. Basically, we do a bit of hardware at the start of the job to get in, and then for the rest of it, we're just looking at the Linux and looking at the mistakes that are being made by the developers. Uh, if you want to be good at embedded testing or if you want to find bugs in embedded devices, it helps if you've got good Linux skills, uh, particularly Linux skills where you're running a busy box environment from a RAM disk, for example. Uh, and it would also help if you've been a sysadmin for somebody else at some point in your life, because if you've ever had to set up and run services and keep them working um, for other people that shout at you, then you've probably got a good idea how those things work and how they could fail in lots of interesting, career-limiting kind of ways. So if you've had that kind of career, it really does help. You've got a bit more of an eye on how these things work. Uh, the two things we're going to try and do at the start of every test is rip out the beating heart of the Linux system, i.e. extract the firmware, and we're going to try and take remote control over it. In other words, get an interactive shell, or be able to um, execute commands and turn that into an interactive shell. Um, 
obviously prompts the question, which came first, the penguin or the egg shell? Um, obviously both. The same in evolution, apparently. Uh, well, you can argue with me later, if that's the case. Um, but yeah, basically, they, they both come first. They're both as important as each other. If you can get an interactive shell, then you can almost certainly extract the firmware. Equally, if you can get hold of the firmware, you can almost certainly find a bug in it that will give you an interactive shell. So we tend to start with one, probably the hardware, trying to get a shell. And when that gets tricky, we move to trying to get the firmware from somewhere. And when that gets tricky, we move back to trying to get some hardware attack. And, then, and we flip between them. We basically take the path of least resistance, the path with the easiest uh, bugs to find, the easiest way to get either interactive or firmware downloaded. Um, if we can, and then, and then from there on, whichever one we've achieved, do achieve the other one, and then we're ready to start actually looking for bugs. So we'll start with firmware because firmware is like an easy, easy thing to do. Where can you find the firmware? Well, obviously, you know, the, the vendor that makes the thing has to host it somewhere. Uh, but equally, people who have taken these devices before. Uh, taking these devices apart before, um, often publish the firmware elsewhere. Um, sometimes it's leaked out of the factory, sometimes it's leaked out of the vendor, um, but they often end up on other sites. If you're looking for firmware, then obviously Google is clearly the answer, whether it's official or unofficial. Um, if the device you've got does an automatic firmware update where you know you push a button or you use a phone app or something to tell the device to update itself and it goes to the internet to go and find um, the firmware file, then you can probably man in the middle that connection and steal the firmware as it goes to get it. And obviously you need some technology and some skills to do that, but we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's not beyond the wit of man. Um, and that's not a bad attack to actually grab the firmware. Obviously the firmware will be on the flash chips. It'll both be expanded as something that it can boot off and use, but often it'll be laying around as the actual firmware file that you could have got from the server. Um, partly because that's how they revert when you screw them up. So if you want to do a factory reset, Often they just reinstall the firmware. It kind of makes sense. Um, these flash chips in the picture here are TSOPs. They're pretty standard kind of things that we see. You know, legs all down two sides. They're dead easy. Surface mount chips. Uh, if you want to remove those, flood solder, uh, get some braid, pull the chip up. Well, flood solder with a scalpel underneath. Um, just keep applying some pressure as you keep on heating that solder up and the chip will just fall off the board. Braid it to clean it up and chuck it in a reader. Um, obviously, you're going to need a reader and a solder and iron, but you know it, this aren't too hard. If the chip's a BGA chip, that's a ball gate array where the um, connections are all on the bottom, they're a lot harder. You can do it; it is possible, and you can read it out. But trying to put the BGA chip back on and making the device work again is a bit tricky. So my advice is work for a large company that makes these devices and demand more than one, um, and never give them back because they will get used to expecting them to be broken by you in the course of your job, and then you never demand them back. And when you get a good one, you get to keep it. Um, other chips you find for Flash are serial EEPROM, and the serial might be UR, I squared C, SPI, one wire, two wire, etc. Lots of different types of um, serial buses that may well talk to it. You'll spot those because they've only got five or six legs, uh, and they're dead easy. I mean, you can pretty much do those in circuit. Just power down the device itself, and then hook up onto those pin legs and wire those back into your Flash reader or um, your serial reader, bus pirate, whatever. Um, if you're extracting from, uh, from dev, then you're going to need interactive control, which is kind of that penguin or egg problem again. Um, so I want to quickly talk about my network. I mentioned man in the middle in the update process earlier. So the kind of network I use, I have my internet broadband route that goes to uh, obviously the internet. And then I put in a Linux box that acts like an internet gateway router. So it provides the HTTP, it provides DNS, all, all relayed through obviously. Um, but on that box, I can also run Wireshark so I can see the traffic and I can run man in the middle proxies on there so I can interact with the encrypted traffic that's going through and try and decrypt it as it's passing so I can see uh, what kind of communications it's having uh, with the internet. Um, I also have a, an open wireless AP. The only reason it's open is because it's a lot easier to eavesdrop on. Um, you should really encrypt these things when you're doing this testing uh, because the wireless bleeds and other people join your network and ruin your day. So, um, But if you do encrypt that AP, then eavesdropping on it becomes a lot harder. Whether you need to eavesdrop on it is debatable, um, but hey. So I generally chuck in a couple of wireless cards, one to connect to the network as a client and one to eavesdrop uh, as needed. And then I drop in my iPhone, jailbroken obviously, and my IoT device. They connect to that network and now I can 
monitor their communications and I can see what they're doing. The idea here is to obtain as much information as you can. But say we're going to try and do the uh, man in the middle and we quickly need to talk about this. So typically firmware updates will be over TLS, Transport Layer Security. Uh, that's the HTTPS um, as opposed to HTTP, for example, when you're browsing the web. Uh, excuse me. You would not believe how warm it is up here. I'm literally dripping with sweat. Anyway, <clears throat> so TLS is usually broken. The reason it's broken, the reason TLS exists is because of Edward Snowden. Woohoo! Um, everyone realizes that things need to be encrypted because large TLA, um, you know, intelligence agencies like to come in and snoop on your data. So everyone employed TLS, but unfortunately, nobody understands TLS in the defender world. And you know, if if you've got three jobs and only one of them is producing embedded devices and your employer don't pay you enough or give you enough time to do a good job, then you're only going to do a crap job at this. So um, expect it to be broken, and it probably is. But we're going to have a quick look at how uh, Man in the Middle works. So we'll talk about it from, say, we'll look at web browsing. Say you've got a monkey on the internet, wants to browse the web, and there's some cloud-based server it wants to talk to. Uh, it wants to make a direct connection and have that encrypted, obviously. Um, so when it when it connects, the server presents its identity and it presents the authority that has signed that identity to say that this is, identity is valid. Uh, everyone trusts um, Chuck Norris, obviously. <laughs> now, what happens if an evil cat like tries to get in the way and can do something with the networking so that the packets go via the cat rather than directly to the server? Can the cat do anything? Well, when the monkey makes the connection, it actually goes to the cat instead of the server, and the cat itself then makes the connection to the server. Uh, the server presents its identity with it signed by the trusted authority, and then the cat presents its own identity signed by its own authority to the monkey. Now, if the monkey's not checking the certificate, as is the case in a lot of TLS implementations, then the monkey will accept this as being a valid connection, and of course it isn't. So the monkey will inc communicate encrypted to the cat, the cat will decrypt it and see it all in clear, and then the cat will encrypt it again on the, on the onward connection to the servers. The monkey won't notice any difference, and uh, the cat's sitting there seeing all the traffic. If that's the firmware file, you've won. Great. Um, but what if the monkey does check that certificate? Well, you know, the, the cat could always fake uh, a copy of the original certificate. Obviously, it, it can't provide the exact same certificate because it won't have the key uh, that set that certificate up. But what it could do is create one with the same settings but with a different key um, and then sign it with its own authority and pass it on to the monkey. Now, if the monkey just checks that the identity is correct, it's going to fall for this. And then, yet again, you're in the same situation. So, But what happens if the monkey bothers to check the authority as well? Well, so it sends to its faked... And it sends a faked authority. Now, if the monkey only checks to see that the authority is the right authority and that the chain of trust works, but doesn't actually check that the authority is a valid one, and I've seen that before on embedded devices, why? Because they can't be bothered to put a list of certificate authorities on the device. So they just assume whatever CA you turn up with is going to be valid. Uh, but they do a quick check to make sure it's called my CA or Bob's CA or whatever. Well, again, the cat could fake all of that. So in these situations, um, there's lots of ways that TLS can fail. and I, I recommend you should always have a go at the man in the middle on the TLS because they've probably done it wrong. Now, where they've done it right, because that does happen occasionally, shock, horror, pick yourself up off the floor, um, if you've got interactive access to the device itself, then you can build this situation where you clone the certificate, you clone the CA. Um, I've got a, call, a tool called Jackal, which, you can, which will just pop those out from command line parameters. Um, you can then... Uh, insert your trusted authority onto the embedded device itself via your interactive access. And there, from then onwards, the man in the middle will work. I mean, you can't just do it arbitrarily on somebody else's camera because you'd need interactive access to their camera. But if you just want to see the traffic so you can analyse it, then that's the way you can do this. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah? Yeah? Awesome. Um, right, the next thing to do, and I'm going to rattle through, obviously, the next thing to do is take pictures, smash the thing apart, you know, start with your hammer and your screwdriver and your smudger and whatever and get it open, take pictures. You need to take pictures of both sides of the boards in high res. Better quality pictures than these because obviously this is me and my rubbish photo taking. Um, I am no David Bailey, as it were. Um, on the chips, there are codes. I'm sure everyone's aware. Google the codes, find out what they are. You'll find that the embedded device looks a bit like this. Obviously, things will be laid out differently and the system on chip in the middle may actually assume the role of many of these things. So the RAM might be part of the SOC. Uh, in, in some cases, the NVRAM, the non-volatile RAM might be part of the SOC. Uh, the network interfaces, USB interfaces, etc., all might be in the SOC. 
Um, but often they're not. If you just check the numbers and Google them, you'll be able to work out what, what chip type each one is, and then that'll give you an idea of what you've got. So if you're looking for the NVRAM, you can grab it. If you're looking for the SOC because you want to know some of it, you can just grab the SOC uh, data sheet and see whether you can understand how it works. Um, on top of that, there'll be these configurations of what look like solder tabs. There'll be gold, roughly this color, but and they look like solder tabs on the board. So sometimes they're labeled up beautifully like this. So the one nearest the SOC is a UART um, serial device, like standard serial, the sort of serial you see in your computer, except, of course, you don't anymore. But the one you saw 20 years ago on your computer, but not running at you know, 20 volts or whatever. It's running at 5 volts or 3.3 volts, maybe 1.8 volts. But it will look in that configuration. Sometimes you get them labelled, which is really nice. So you can just hook that thing up to your serial, USB serial device, and now you've got potentially a, a serial connection. Um, sometimes they're not labelled, and you might, and you just look for that pattern of square, round, 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 or square, round, round. Or you look for the SOC data sheet, and you find the serial port and the SOC data sheet, and you trace the wires out yourself. Um, there's a number of things you could do. We're going to talk about those in a second. The other configuration you see on here is JTAG. Um, sometimes it's labelled, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's this configuration, sometimes it's different. I'm not going to talk about JTAG again in this talk because it is literally our port of last resort. Um, it's rubbish. We find it's proprietary, it's slow, it's difficult to use, and we will only go there when every other, other attack has pretty much failed. So um, if you want to play with JTAG, do so. Often I hear a lot of people when I say I'm an embedded tester, they go, oh, JTAG. And I go, yeah, it's shit, isn't it? And they go, really? What? Hey? You know, because that's all they've heard about embedded. Surely that's how you attack these things. It's not, well, not really. You know, if you're developing things, yeah, JTAG might be awesome. But if you're hacking them, not so much. Um, if, you're, if your board's just got these gold solder tab looking things all over it, but they aren't laid out in any configuration or they're not labeled and you want to work out which ones they are, well, First thing to know is they're not gold solder tabs. Nothing's soldering to these. These are better nails contact points for testing in the factory. So in the factory, they have a thing with these pins that stick up and the board is pressed on top of it and they connect with a number of these uh, points and they use it to test the board to make sure the board works. Well, this, you, the serial port is almost always used in that testing situation. And so some of these... Um, contact points will have little dimples in the middle where they've been touched by a bed of nails and some won't so you know if you've got like sort of 20 or 30 to look at and only 10 have got dimples in the middle start with those 10 because they're probably the ones that are more useful to you what do you do with them well we chuck it through a logic analyzer so logic analyzers like a digital oscilloscope um, they're relatively cheap usb devices these are just pictures i don't you know, i don't even think that logic analyzer and that bit of software go together they're certainly not the ones i have they're just ripped off google uh, but the idea being you hook up all the wires coming off the logic analyzer to the different points on the board um, sample uh, stick the sampling on on the on the software reboot the device a few times and you'll get some traces um, by looking at the traces and looking at the widths of the pulses you can work out the speed they're running at if they're running at roughly uart speed for example or um the sort of thing you expect from i squared c or spi then you can pretty much spot them and you then you can use the software itself to try and decode that data um after the event so you're not having to do it real time you just capture it in real time and then decode it in lots of different types of ways to find out if you can make any of those pins give you some data in this one it says the word found uh backslash n i think across uh, is what they found on it but but essentially you'll see things like the linux kernel starting up once you found that you know you've got the transmit pin the receive pin will probably be next to it unless they've gone out of their way to obscure it uh, we have had them where they're on the other side of the board and all sorts uh, because sometimes they really don't want us to find the serial port but um yeah they're great if you can't find a serial port or you can't find the port you want get a logic analyzer uh, what do we do when we've got the serial connections um, or we've guessed them, we think we've got them? Well, we use Bus Pirates. Uh, they're about £30, pounds, uh, maybe a bit less. You can get them from Cool Components, Spark Fun, places like that. Uh, so we just, the it basically, it can emulate SPI, I2C, one wire, two wire, and a whole host of other serial protocols. And it provides a USB serial interface back to the computer. So you connect to it and you talk to it over Minicom and you configure it to do the thing you want and it sets up those pins uh, to be the right kind of pins for what you've asked it for. And then you can bridge together the two chips essentially so that your serial coming in is then bridged to the serial leaving and going into the device. Uh, the other device on the, on the slide, which is blown up to about twice the size it should be, uh, but you needed to be able to see it, that's just a simple FTDI connector. It only does UART 
um, essentially, uh, you buy them for about three pound fifty from Amazon or eBay, uh, and they'll do as good a job as a bus pirate when you only need your art. So sometimes the timing on a bus pirate struggles at 115 kilobits um, is is a warning. Uh, sometimes we've managed to fix that by tweaking the timing manually, uh, but sometimes it doesn't work. Whereas a USB FTDI at 115k just works. So have both. Take your pick. Um, as there's always a use for both of them. Uh, just to quickly show you how easy it is to set up a bus pirate. Um, this is like the mini com session. So we can sort of see the bus pirate uh, logins thing and is a prompt. And we went M for mode. We selected UART. We then put in some answers to questions to give it the parameters of what kind of UART we want. And right to the end, we ran macro one, which is like the bracket one bracket bit right towards the, the end of it. Um, obviously, it asks us if we're sure, because once you do this, your device is then trapped in bridge mode until you uh, depower it. Um, so you say yes and then if you're really lucky it will already be logged in as root and you have now won you've now got interactive access so you can now go and grab the firmware from it or whatever you want to do Um, I'd say probably 25% of the cases we find it's already logged in as root no login prompt to get past in another 50% plus cases there'll be a login prompt um, and you can guess it's root and no password or root and root as the password or admin with root as the password or the whatever's written on the sticky label on the bottom of the, of the device, you know, admin and whatever. But you can guess. There's about 20 guesses that you want to make at this point about what those creds might be. And if you can't guess within about 20 goes, make the assumption that it's not what you expect and it's hidden in the firmware. So wait until we've got the firmware, pull out the password file, crack the password for the account, and then go back to this and then log in. Um, On a couple of devices, um, we don't find any serial port. On some devices, more commonly, we find the serial port during the boot-up process. We get the kernel messages, we get a lot of log output, but we don't get a prompt at the end of it, which is really annoying. Um, And they do that because they've simply turned the thing off. Well, We'll come back to how you might attack that, but things like the bootloader, we might want to change what the kernel is doing when it starts up. Um, so instead of running um, slash init or slash sbin slash init, which might be some program or script to start up the system, we might change that pro- command line parameter to slash bin slash sh so that it starts up um, a, a shell instead of running the system up, at which point we can then run whatever command they would have run um, in the background with an ampersand on the end, and that'll bring all the system up and leave us with a login prompt, uh, a, a logged in root prompt. Um, other things we might, yeah, there, there's other kind of attacks we could make at this point. Um, so literally, um, given the kernel parameters, if you can edit the bootloader, we can, we can set one of the kernel parameters that actually turns on the serial port, you know, adds a getty on, um, on the TTY. So there's stuff you can do if you don't have, but in most cases we find it will start up, there'll be a login prompt and we can go root, return, return, and we're in as root. Okay, so most of the time we can guess our way in. Uh, So what do we do once we're there? Well, we want to get stuff out, obviously, uh, try and find some useful bits and bobs. Um, This is just a snapshot of some of the things that we typically run. I mean, if you do use Linux, this is pretty much all obvious uh, bits and pieces. Uh, But what we're trying to do is get an idea of how the system works, how it hangs together, what's running, how the system's laid out, um, how the networking processes fit together, that sort of thing. So we tend to dump all of this stuff into files, tire it up, get it off, and uh, refer to it continuously while we're testing the device because it saves us having to go into the device again and type the command again. Uh, We like to do most of our work on a nice Linux box with all of our tools available, not on the crappy little embedded device that's got no tools. Um, so the obvious thing to do at this point is to regress the firmware. We want to get the firmware off the device. We've got interactive access. I did say once you get interactive, you should be able to get the firmware off. Well, yeah, simply you need to find some space uh, because you need to DD. You need to copy the contents out of, out of the actual dev nodes. Um, quite simply, if you if you went into slash dev, which is the dev node kind of directory that has um, these sort of special kernel hooks to all of the different devices that the system has. Uh, On a a normal Linux system, there's loads of them. There's probably 200. But on a embedded device, there's kind of 20, 30. You know, it's tiny numbers. Uh, So you can go through them all, have a look at the dev nodes, have a look what they're called, and just find the ones that you want. Uh, One of them will have a number of numbers. So there'll be like MTD1, MTD2, MTD3, MTD4, etc. Or there might be MTD block one. MTD block two, it might be SDA, it might be SSD. There's a lot of SD, there's a lot of different ones, but you'll be able to spot it because it was the one with the incre- incrementing numbers. 
they are the disk partitions, essentially, except, of course, it's not a disk. It's a solid state device in non-volatile RAM. Um, so when you find them, we can't copy those directly. We need to use DD to extract the contents from them, like to copy the actual underlying block information rather than the link itself. So you need to find some space. So we use mount and DF to find the space, DD it somewhere where there's space, and then pull them off. Um, how do you get them off? Well, TFTP is my preference because every device seems to have it and it's trivial to set up a TFTP server for lots of good reasons. Um, but more fun is if it's got a web server, chuck them in the web route. You know, you probably have a you know, complete interactive access over this thing. You can write anywhere you like. Well, if you chuck it in the web route, you can just browse those files down quite happily um, with your web browser. Uh, alternatively, set up some kind of tunnel. Some devices have USB, either as a client or a host. Um, some may even have an SD card inside, which is perfect. I had one that had a four gig SD card inside and it had no data on it. I don't even know what data was supposed to be written to it, but four gig was easily enough for what I wanted to do. Wrote the whole lot to that, pulled the SD card, checked it in Linux box and had all the files. Uh, the other thing we want, we want to do is we want to get the running firmware. What's the difference between firmware and running firmware? Well, the firmware is the one that the factory set that is there for when the system starts up, and the running firmware is what it looks like after it's started up, when it's created all of its temporary files. Um, it's quite interesting. The temporary files that are created are literally the ones that describe what's going on in the system. So if you can get the running firmware expanded as a file system and you, and you can get the actual firmware expanded as a file system, you could do a diff between the two and it will quickly tell you which uh, files change in the startup, which will give you some clues where to look if you're looking for settings, for example. But it's very useful to have both because the surprising differences between the two, and they often are surprising for reasons that you can never quite fathom, but when you, those differences will be the keys to finding out how the system works. So exactly the same trick as before, except we tie up the file systems instead. Um, so what does a firmware image look like or what does a firmware look like? Well, it's divided up into a number of different sections, obviously. Uh, the bootloader starts the system up. It starts up the, the kernel. It provides the kernel with an uncompressed RAM disk that's pulled out um, from an MTD block. And then you have a number of compressed file systems, possibly. By that, I mean SquashFS or CramFS. They're pretty much read-only, read into memory as a RAM disk, and then they're used read-write by the system. But none of the changes ever get written back to the block. They're, they're kind of just RAM disks. Uh, but then you have real file systems running on the SD, which will probably be in some esoteric format because you can't run like ext3 or ext4 on a on a um, underlying sd device because you trash them so instead we have very odd file system formats like ubi or yafs so you have to look but you'll find those and they'll be like complete read write ones and they're useful because if you want persistence so you can get some code on there that's going to run every time it starts up they're the places where you might want to hide it um, and then there'll be raw settings partitions, partitions which you can run strings on and find some interesting information, but you can't find a way of mounting it. Well, it's probably because it's just written too rawly, you know, as, as directly. Um, in a firmware image, these are often packed together one after another. Sometimes they're packed in clever ways. Sometimes they're encrypted, but not usually. Um, sometimes they're signed, but hardly ever. But hey, ho. So how do we extract, if we have one of those files that's got all the, say we've like man in the middle with the update mechanism or we found the firmware online and we just want to like download it because we've got one big like four gig image or whatever it is and we'll just extract the bits out of it. Well, you can use bin walk, but bin walk is a bit poor, a bit rubbish. It'll guess um, based on signatures in the file, very much like antivirus and we all know that antivirus sucks. So, but hey, it might just work in this case. You know, if they're not trying to hide stuff, then, you know, give Binwalk a try. The minus E switch will actually extract the um, sections for you, or you can just take down the numbers and use DD and pull them out yourself. Um, but I should say, if any of this, if any, at any point you sort of think, wow, this is all going over my head, I don't understand that. As long as you get the basic idea of what we're trying to achieve on the slide, Google it. It's, it's all off the shelf techniques. I mean, everyone's been talking about this for years. So, um, but then, yeah, to actually extract the individual sections, once you've got the sections out as individual files, you want to extract them, then firmware mod kit, of which there's about 200 different versions because it got forked badly, um, find those. They can do all sorts of things. The unsquash FS all and uncram FS all are brilliant. If you've never tried to unsquash a squash file system, you probably don't realize that there's about 19 different variants of squash FS and you have to have the right one to extract. Uh, they do horrible things like just change the SQSH from the beginning into capitals or reverse the order or change it to four different letters entirely and your unsquash tool 
suddenly dies, doesn't work. Um, there's also lots of other tools I mentioned on there. You can get them all from the internet. Uh, 7-Zip uh, on Windows is always worth a mention. And the reason for that is because uh, I believe well, it finds lots of stuff that we don't find any other way. I don't know why. It, we think it's because it's really lax on error checking. So when things go wrong in the archive, it just goes, yeah, whatever, and carries on. Whereas all the Linux tools go, no, you have to stop. This isn't a valid archive. So definitely get 7-Zip and stick it in your Windows VM because you'll probably want it one day. I'll let you digest that one while I have a drink. I'm not drinking enough, if anything. Uh, right. Whew. Be good for time. Yeah, we're only halfway through. This is about right. Yeah, this will be fine. We might even finish early at this rate. You never know. Um, oh, here we go. Ding dong. Beer delivery. Thank you very much. I hope I'm not talking too fast, but I don't say so you probably can't stop me from where you're sat. So you just have to accept it. <laughs> Maybe watch the video later or something. I don't know. Um, so um, this is a modular view of how an embedded device looks. Pretty much every one of them runs Linux or the ones that we care about do because they're the ones that we can hack easily. Um, they typically run DHCP and DNS. If they're a client device that connects to your own home network, then they'll have DHCP clients and DNS clients. If they're a router or gateway device, then they'll probably have DNS servers and DHCP servers or DNS relays and DHCP relay, whatever, however they want to do it. Most of them have a web server on there. Why? Because it's easy to tell your users. Users know how to use web browsers. So you say, go to this URL and uh, it pops a, a page and then they can log in and they can set the settings up and users feel fine and happy with that. So we see that, you know, that's the standard go-to for an embedded device. As you're probably well aware, you've probably got some... They've got these horrible web servers on. Well, of course, it's not a real web server like Apache. You know, it's going to be a web server that um, is tiny and it's got squeezed onto an embedded device. And the way they do that is they leave out all the security checking, um, which is just hilarious, really. Uh, there's different types. You often find go-ahead web server, often with a web prop backend. Uh, you get mini HTTPD, you get Lighty. Um, and, you know, more or less, they have bugs that you can dig out and find. Um, on top of that, they typically run CGI scripts because they're still Web 1.0 and uh, they love them. And the great thing with CGI is that there's command injection opportunities left, right and centre because, again, they're written by people who have no idea about security. So uh, on top of that, these days we find web services because they're feeling a bit, little bit more Web 2.0. And, um, again, that might be JSON or XML or whatever, but their parsers are pretty poor and out of date. So um, they're, all, they're all attack services that we want to look at. Uh, UPnP, again, if this is a gateway device, it'll probably be a UPnP server. If it's an, if it's a media device, it might be a UPnP server. Um, but if it's a device that needs um, access to the internet, like your Xbox or something like that, then it might use UPnP to tell your router to open a port up for it so the internet can get to the device via your router. Um, UPnP, we know, is really, it really, a lot of the time it has bugs in it. That's all I'll say. Um, you need a tool um, to exercise UPnP properly. Um, we have one in-house, which is brilliant, but it's never getting published, I'm afraid. Uh, but you do need a tool. So if you want to interrogate UPnP, it's kind of like an HTTP XML kind of thing sitting on top of a UDP SSDP listener. Um, yeah, if that made no sense, then that's how it feels trying to hack UPnP. But they do make massive mistakes because no one's looking at it. So... Um, and then there'll be other services running on the device that are specific. So if it's a camera, it might have a video service where you can watch the video of the camera. You know, if it's a VoIP telephone, it might have an audio service. Um, on top of that, there'll be comms to the cloud because at some point you want to go to the cafe. Um, like, you know, might, you might want a baby monitor that you can put on in your house and then go down and have lunch, you know, or have dinner with all your friends and watch the baby through the phone. Really stupid idea. We called that the Madeleine McCann model when that one came out. And told them what a stupid idea it was. But um, there will be comms with the cloud because you want to be able to roam. You want to be able to leave the house. And then the device will talk to the cloud. And then you'll talk to the cloud via your phone and, and get the data that way. Uh, on top of that, there's the NVRAM for the settings. Um, that is an attack surface because it tends to trust whatever it finds in the NVRAM as being gospel. So if you've put something in there, it will use it without really checking to see if it's in the right format or anything like that. So we want to look at those things. Um, 
So what I'd say is you want to get used to uh, how the device works. Use it as an actual device um, and and feel around it and get an idea of what all... You'll have, you'll have all of these services running, running those PS and NetStack commands from before, but it'd be useful to actually understand how they hang together. When you kind of have that understanding, just start attacking them. So the sort of things we're looking at for are um, command injection. Command injection is a great little bug. It's where... Um, your input that you type in um, gets added to a buffer somewhere and then they call system with that buffer or they call exec or p open or, or, or any other way of starting a shell process. Um, and if you happen to put in some bad characters in your input, like these back ticks in this situation, then by the time it gets to the point where it runs it in the system command, the shell interprets that as I want to run this command, like your input, um, in another shell and take the output of that and use that as the you know, placeholder sort of replacement in the command. Uh, backticks are only one way to do it. There's like semicolon, there's uh, dollars, there's uh, brackets, there's all sorts of things you can do um, depending on the actual shell in use, which varies from device to device. Um, but yeah, if you've got anywhere you can input data, you want to be sticking some back ticks in um, and various other shell meta characters and seeing what happens. And, and, you know, that could be a form on a web page, but it could be the response to a DHCP request, for example, um, which is the funky places where embedded dev developers don't look for bugs. Yeah, you know, sort of like, here's a DNS reply that happens to have back ticks in. Oh, what do they do with that? They run it. Brilliant. Um, we have the traditional buffer overflow. That's simply where the amount of input that you provide is more than what the developer expected. And he conveniently, or she conveniently, allows you to copy all of that data over the top of their buffer and over the top of whatever comes after it in memory, which might be another buffer or other variables. So you might be able to affect the state of other things. Um, if you provide enough data, it might start overflowing whatever comes after it, the structures of the program. So, you know, if your variable is on the stack, then you might run over the um, return address for the function and you might be able to control the program counter from there. I will say there will be no modern Linux protections on here. So if you can overwrite the return address and get execution, then nothing will get in your way. There's no stack canaries. There's no uh, address randomization or anything along those lines. Uh, if you're in heap, um, then you'll probably overflow the heap structures, at which point the next three that gets called against this. Again, you've got complete code execution. If this makes no sense, there's some papers on the internet you can read. One's called Once Upon a Free, and the other one, um, uh, I can't think, I can't remember off the top of my head. That's it, smashing the stack for fun and profit. Aleph one, I've, yeah. Anyway, so you believe how much I'm melting up here. It's like I'm dripping out of my eyes onto my laptop now. Drink more. Every mistake. <laughs> Okay, but still good for time. Um, right, so uh, the next um, uh, one last class of bug. I mean, obviously, there's millions of different classes of bugs, but another class of bug that we always look for, uh, format string vulnerabilities. Format strings are the ones that um, people forget to look for sometimes because it's, they don't completely understand how they work, perhaps. But it's as simple as somewhere in the program, the developer uses one of the printf uh, functions and uses the and, and the format string argument that is provided to it, you have some control over. Some of your buffer ends up in there for magic reasons. And the magic reasons are because they generally use in a printf function like sprintf or uh, snprintf when they should be using a copy function. And they're simply trying to copy from a format, from one buffer to another. But the, because they're using printf, the, the, cop, the buffer they're copying from gets interpreted as a format string, which they probably weren't expecting. Uh, they might not be expecting you to put percent characters in there, for example, and they might not sanitize them out. So if you put percent characters into that buffer, and again, I'm not saying this is just like forms on a web page, for example. This might be, you know, I say DNS responses, or um, it might be literally in the NVVAM settings when you can get something in there, put the percents in there, because it's not checking or sanitizing. Then um, when it comes to use that printf uh, function or, or from that family, uh, it interprets that as um, a variable on the stack that it needs to insert into the, into the string. And if you haven't, you know, if you're providing extra requirements for extra stack variables and they, they aren't being provided to the function, then it will find them on the stack. And with good use of format string characters, uh, percent %n being very interesting, um, you can take complete uh, you know, code execution from this, from this point. So um, 
yeah, stick a percent in or percent S or a whole load of percent X's and a few percent N's and see if it crashes because it probably will. So um, obviously looking for bugs might be quite tricky. It might not be your normal thing. So um, of course we always take, we haven't got a lot of time when we're doing this for a day job. So what we do is we, we typically go to the internet and ask the internet what bugs exist. And the best way to place to find them is on the actual page on, which lists all the bugs. So um, look them up and find out if they're relevant. Uh, often the modules you need won't be there or whatever, but find out if they're relevant and then... Um, you know, sometimes the vendors will change the code themselves and they'll accidentally fix bugs without realising it. And that's really, really annoying. But um, on the web page where you can get the code, you can usually get the release notes so you can find out what changed. So if you the CVE details tells you which version fixed it, you can get the um, look at the release notes for that version. It will tell you what fixes they made. Sometimes they'll tell you in quite a lot of detail. Um, on top of that, you can download the source code. Um, so I recommend download the source code for the version where they fixed the bug and the version before and the version that you've got. Um, do a diff between the version where they fixed it and the previous version. That will give you the exact change required to fix the bug and then retrofit that fix back to the version you had before and you'll see where the bug is. Once you see where the bug is, you now just have to use a little bit of science and maths to make you to be able to exploit it. Um, so, you know, the great thing with open source software is they're really open. <laughs> So what else uh, do we look at? Well, if you don't have, if it's not open source software, you know, I mean, half the services will be open source because they're too lazy to write a web server, but half the services will be bespoke because no one's writing the code that they need. So they sit and they beaver away and they produce some stuff that typically has a load of bugs in it. So um, you generally only have the binary kind of uh, executables at this point. So we need to disassemble them. So we use IDA Pro, which is a screenshot of this tool here um, it's not that expensive for what it does I mean there's a reason why it costs money it's because it's really really good um, the add-ons themselves are amazing but they cost even more money um, the things we're kind of look auditing for is the use of like you know system exec popen um, things in that kind of families because they um, run commands in the shell and if we somehow control some of those buffers that get run then we might be able to get our command in there that's where we might look for command injection for example uh, we look for the str copy strun copy mem copy uh, there's a strun copy strln kind of like f configuration which is pretty awful um, but we're looking for buffer overflows you know if, if anywhere where it's copying data from one place to another and it might be ignoring how long it is uh, as I say, the classic is where um, you swap out your str copy for a strun copy, which has a limit on how many characters to copy. And then they do a strln on the source buffer to decide how many characters to copy. And you're like, no, no, no. Surely it's the length of the destination buffer that matters, not the length of the data you're going to copy, because that's no different to just copying it regardless. Uh, so mistakes get made left, right and centre, and no one's really looking for them. Nobody in their QA teams actually know how to find these bugs and fix them. So... Go look. Uh, printf family, obviously, for format string vulnerabilities and buffer overflows and the likes. Uh, receive, read, anything that gets data and handles data uh, from the user, from you, from the network. Um, have a look in there because they typically will expect the data to only be a certain size and you can probably see that quite easily. Uh, and the other thing is, is look for the hard-coded values. Uh, it's really difficult to um, use creds, uh, credentials or crypto keys on an embedded device and secure them. Um, it is potentially possible with a proper secured bootloader to have uh, a chain of encryption where the first key lives in silicon that the the you know, users can't get hold of, but no one ever implements that because it's expensive and it's difficult. So instead what they do is they hide the creds in the file system and then someone spots them and goes, do you know, if you go to this file, you can get all the crypto keys. And they go, oh no. So they hide them in the binaries instead. They literally compile them into the binaries. And do you know what's brilliant about that? They don't change. At least when it was a file on the file system, you could go, someone's discovered your crypto key, and they go, yes, change it, and it, it changed. But when it's compiled into the binary, you can't change that without updating the firmware. So once you find one key or one encrypt or credential or one um, piece of useful information in the binary on your device, you can apply that to every other version of that device out in the wild. So you go to your next door neighbor's house where they've got one, you already know the keys in it because it has to be the same because the software is the same. Um, so yeah, they're probably going to be, if they're in the binary, they're going to be encoded or obfuscated. So you sometimes have to do a bit of tracking to actually work out what they are, but you know, they're there, uh, go and have a look. Um, 
So on top of that, again, this is another post Snowden thing, but uh, lots of people add crypto to their devices, partly because it's a bit of a sales tech, you know, technique these days, and partly because they feel like you know the, the NSA is watching them. Well, if they implement it themselves, it will be broken. I can guarantee that now. Um, the reason I say that is because world-class cryptographers implement crypto and, and make mistakes. Um, it's, it's really, really hard to get crypto right. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. I mean, I've broken AES 128-bit before, not because there's a flaw in the AES algorithm that I exploited, but because the way they used it was poor. They only had a million different keys when there should have been a trillion, trillion, trillion different keys. Um, but all I'll say is everything has crypto now. And if you are trying to find bugs and stuff and you don't understand crypto, then you're missing out masses because typically you see something that looks random or encrypted and you think, oh, I don't know what to do with that. That's encrypted. Um, take one of the free courses at Coursera.org, such as the Stanford crypto course or the Maryland crypto course. And next time you see some encrypted data, you'll go, ha ha, I bet that is really badly broken. I just need to look in a little bit harder to find out how. Um, and they do. In fact, that previous slide, if anyone did bother reading the code on it, was an example of broken crypto. Um, but I won't go into that any further. Uh, modifications, you're going to want to change it. If you're trying to repurpose, if you're trying to repurpose, um, repurpose your device so that you can make it do stuff it shouldn't do, you know, run an IRC server on it or make it make cups of coffee or whatever, then um, you're going to need to modify it. Uh, but equally, if you're hacking it to find bugs, again, you're going to need to modify it because you want persistence. You want your shell to come up every time you turn it on. Um, to make life easier for you. You don't have to want to exploit it every time it turn, you turn it on. You want to be lazy, like a pen tester. So um, things to change is the bootloader. Like I was saying before, we can change the kernel options. So we start up with a serial port. We can change the kernel options. So we start up a different startup script instead of uh, init. Um, we might start a different kernel. We might use a different RAM disk. There's all sorts of things you can do there. You can change the RAM disk, literally extract it, You know, copy it off, egress it the way we talked about before, extract it, uh, change the files in it, repack it, and then get it back on the device and then overwrite the RAM disk that exists. It's a bit of a cavalier, crazy approach, but it will just work. Um, other things you can do is file systems. These might be easier. Mounting file systems that are designed for SD cards uh, is really hard uh, on your Linux box, unless you've got it on the actual SD itself. So UBIFS probably won't mount, but like your UBIFS extract will work. Um, if you want to so the best way to modify these is from the interactive shell itself. You want to be on the device to modify uh, running file systems rather than trying to do it uh, externally like we would with a RAM disk. Um, we want to overwrite the MVRAM, obviously, depending on what it is. And um, repacking the firmware file is a great idea because no one really checks the signatures on firmware to see if they're valid or not. Um, pretty much if you can find the way of giving the system a firmware file, it'll probably believe you that that's a valid firmware file. Um, when they start checking signatures, as they sometimes do, then you might need to find the bit of code that checks the signature and extract, um, the, find a way around that bit of code. You probably won't have the key uh, to create your own signatures, but you might be able to turn off the signature checking, for example. Um, so we mentioned the update mechanism before. I want to mention it again briefly because we've now come a long way from where we were sort of 40 minutes ago. Um, so imagine we're attacking the update mechanism to deal with the firmware, for example. One of the things that's interesting about the update mechanism is typically written by different people who write all the other TLS code. So what you've got on the system is the vendor that supplies the chipset and the underlying uh, reference design, they often provide the update mechanism because that's part of their bit of house. And then that gets passed on to the next vendor down the line who then writes the software on top that provides the network services and the video services or whatever it is that your device does. So if they... Have made a mis if they haven't made a mistake, for example, in the actual network services, don't assume they haven't made a mistake in the update process because they're probably written by different people who will make different mistakes. So um, do go after it. If you can get the firmware, then there's lots of other ways of updating it. Um, there's often hidden f web pages on the device that lets you update firmware. Um, there's usually a function or a command line tool on the device itself that will let you update firmware. So, yeah, go for um, NVRAM. It's a massive gaping hole. You know, it should be encrypted. It's so easy to extract the contents of. Why isn't it encrypted? Well, the reason is because encryption is really hard, like I keep saying. Um, there's a lot of settings. 
excuse me. <laughs> There's a lot of settings data hidden in there, so um, you might want to extract them. In some cases, they do clever things like encrypt some of the settings data. I mean, I had one device where every da- every piece of data in the settings was in clear, and I could just go. There was a, they provided me with a command line tool that I could run, like nvram get, and it would just like tell me. I'll give it the name of a key, and it would just give me back the value. It's brilliant. Um, but one of those uh, values it gave me back, the password, was encrypted. And um, it's, of, of course, the device itself has to be able to extract that key and decrypt it. So everything you need to decrypt it is in your hands already. You just need to find out where that is. And that's where we go back to the binaries and we start auditing it, looking for keys, because when you find keys, that's the sort of place where they might get used. Um, so I sort of say identify the complexity and then extract the data. And the reason for that is... If you just jump in with both feet, start writing code or start trying to build a technique to try and get the encrypted data out, you might spend a few weeks doing that before you're successful. Uh, And in the meantime, miss loads and loads and loads of other bugs like I did. Uh, so identify the complexity first and then if it looks reasonable or it, when it becomes the most high priority thing to look at, then look at it, then it, then extract the data. So we're almost at the end. Um, the attack surface is massive and tiny at the same time. Um, there aren't many services running on these devices, so it's quite a small attack surface. But when you look at the individual, the actual bits and pieces, there's so many things you can do with them, and there's so little protection in place to stop you doing stuff with them that, um, let's say, it's big and small at the same time. What I typically say is go after all of it. Audit the lot. Um, you know, there's very little excuse to leave anything running on that device that you ha- don't actually understand because there's, you know, I mean, you might be able to count the processes that are running on two hands. That's how f- little there will be actually running on the device. And if you can't audit all of those processes, then, you know, take some more time, get some more skills, do some more training, learn some more stuff because the bugs will be there, I guarantee. Um, I think the rest of that slide kind of speaks for itself, but yeah, there's just lots of mistakes that people make. It's a lot easier to hack these devices. Oh yeah, that's what, well, it seems we've got a couple of minutes, I was going to say actually. So I, I went and saw a talk at 44Con last year. I think it's last year or the year before. And um, someone was hacking into a kid's toy. The toy was a, ra- a rabbit, a plastic rabbit, and it had these um, ears that could move. Uh, had, and light up and things like that. And you had an iPhone app and you could kind of go like ears up, ears down, like, uh, you know, go red, go green, whatever it was. I can't remember the details. I can't remember what, what actual toy it was. And uh, the guy did a talk about how he hacked it, right? And, and fair play, he hacked it. But he treated it like it was a server on the internet. At no point did he take the covers apart and have a look inside. And it's like, it's in your hands. You know, if you're hacking something on the internet, yeah, it's really hard to go to that data center, pull the server out of a rack, get your screwdriver out and start taking it apart and steal bits from inside it to make your job easier. But if it's in your hands, like you've bought the device yourself, get a hammer, hit it hard and find out what's inside it. Because, you know, when, when we were 10, that's how we discovered how things worked. And now all of a sudden we're adults. Oh, no, we've got to do it the, like, you know, highbrow way of like, you know, be clever and stuff. No, we don't have to be clever. We can just take stuff apart and look at how it works. Uh, it's mostly Linux host auditing, as I said at the beginning. So get good at that. When you fail, it's because your Linux skills aren't good enough typically. So, you know, that's how it'll go. We, we all go there. We all have to learn off each other. Um, but as I say, it's a lot easier to start with a firmware image. or And sometimes you get that from the web. And sometimes you get that by taking the device apart. But it's very satisfying to smash a device open and end up with a serial port and be logged in as root. And through that, extract the firmware. Like even taking the chip off the board and extracting the firmware from it that way. It's a very satisfying thing to do, even if it takes another five minutes. Um, because you feel like you've done something useful, I guess. So in summary, get interactive root, get the firmware and the running firmware and diff the two, and then look for vulnerabilities in everything that is running. And you will find them and you'll have success. Um, if, yeah, it's not that hard, honestly. Hey, if I can do it and I'm drinking Guinness, then I'm sure you can all do it. Uh, I'll be in the Port Cullis Cisco tent 
Not that I work for either of those companies, but they're so lovely with their hospitality that I'll be over there drinking their beer. So if you want to ask any questions, please do. I'll quickly answer the obvious question before I stop because I've got another four minutes according to this. Um, The two people on the left, that's me and my boss looking for bugs. Uh, The two people in the middle, that's our customer at the company we work for being gleefully happy that we found holes in their product before they released it to market. Because this means they don't have to get embarrassed and explain to their boss why we've got all these vulnerability notices coming in or things are being talked about at conferences and screwing our our brand positioning. And the the final person uh, over on the uh, right there, um, that's how the vendor responds to us telling them that their product is shit. (laughs) Pardon my French, but it was kind of necessary to add the emphasis to that final point so uh, my website has uh, a few bits of tools on there if you like um, debuggers and ptrace then um, uh, there's a couple of tools on on my website that you can you can get hold of in the future there'll be more stuff on there but right now that's where we're at so thank you very much we've, we've got time for a couple of questions if anyone's got any anyone at the moment cool I've got one very quickly. Go. So your job now is securing things. Um, given that, all right, if you do your job perfectly, given that you should know what you're doing, but new vulnerability is going to come out. So how can you protect something? So you, you can release products, say, I can't find anything in here. And then new vulnerabilities come out. So do you think it's ultimately impossible to... Well, things? the new vulnerability... Yeah, so it's, it depends. If it's a new class of vulnerability that we haven't considered, then fair enough, because the new classes of vulnerabilities do come out and you have to retro-check those against every device that you've ever thought about. Um, but new classes of vulnerability only come out once in a blue moon, usually, like once every 10 years or so. So... They, they will be there, but don't worry about them too much. Um, in terms of actual bugs, if I do my job well, then I will have audited all of the code that is running on the device, and I will have found all the bugs that exist or, or contained it within a defense in depth kind of environment so that you can't exploit them. And then when new bugs supposedly come out, they won't affect the product. Hi, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I wonder how Secure Boot will um, affect your work or does already affect um, the stuff we try. We're only just starting to see Secure Bootloaders coming through. Um, we're, we're not hacking mobile phones, um, for example. Uh, we might hack mobile phone apps, but we're not actually hacking a lot of mobile phones themselves, which is where we're seeing SBL coming in early. Um, some routers are starting to employ SBL, and yes, it will make our job harder um, because we one of our attack uh, vectors, as I said, is, is via the bootloader. And if you can't modify the bootloader. But the other thing, the thing to remember is that the people implementing the SBL don't have any skills, history um, or knowledge in how to implement that securely. So they will make mistakes. Um, again, the trick is to not just naturally assume that it's going to be secure because they've used secure bootloader type technology, but to think, how would, how would I have messed this up? Oh, yeah, I'd have forgotten to do that. Or I'd have done it on a Friday afternoon when I've just been in the pub. And then you'll find the bugs because, so, yes, it will make it harder, but, you know, I'm still confident. Wonderful. Cool. I don't think we've got any other questions now. So uh, you, you've demonstrated very well that Guinness is good for you because I've been drinking water and fell off stage and uh, <laughs> you've been all right. <laughs> thank so, you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin Sheldrake. Kel-